Hello, I'm Betamax, your personal healthcare assistant, on a rating from 1 to 10. How do you feel? <laughs> Uh, zero, zero. <laughs> it's fine. Deactivate. Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Big Hero 6, the TV series, the pilot. Just to start this off, apparently I will be saying Baymax wrong repeatedly because I keep thinking Betamax as in the tape format. Yes, and it doesn't matter how many times I've told him he's wrong. I, apparently I hear it that way even when the show pronounces it, so... Yes, and even when they put it on screen as the episode title, Baymax Returns, B-A-Y-M-A-X. Well, the pilot came out, and we decided to watch it. Actually, it came out a, a little bit ago, I didn't look at the exact date, but we finally got a chance to sit down and watch it. And there haven't been any episodes since then, so... Hey, we're all caught up. Yep! So I'm gonna start off with... The animation is weird. It looks good? But it's, like, not smooth in certain areas. I wonder if it will smooth out over time, but I don't quite know. It's hard to put my finger out, but there's something off about it. It's like they don't use enough frames for lip flaps, and the shapes of the mouse kind of look off sometimes. Oh, it seems like they're missing some in-betweening, and I knew they weren't going to computer animate it, but it feels kind of heavily cel-shaded. It's like it's somewhere in between being an American comic book and a Japanese animated show. And I think it is being kind of done inside the computer. It's not really being hand-drawn per se. There's just something about it that feels like it's done in something like Flash. There's just elements to it that feel like, yeah. And I have a feeling we're gonna see that thing over a time like we did in My Little Pony. If you watch the first season now of My Little Pony, you're like, this looked good, right? And you look at the current season, you're like, wow, big difference. So if the show stays in production long enough, I'm sure we'll see improvements to the animation. But now on to what we thought of the story. And how many times we cringed in the first part of it. He's a genius. Come on, Hiro, you know better than this. Also, why was it so difficult to put Baymax's skeleton back together and have access to the lab? In the movie... You were barely necessarily a student, yet you managed to make armor for everybody. But you have trouble getting into one lab to work on one project, when you're officially a student taking classes. Yeah, I think they set that up for more conflict, and I think they're setting up the principal to be a real obstacle for them during the school days of when, oh look, the city is being destroyed! I wonder if Big Hero 6 is going to arrive. Why did five of my students have to just go to the bathroom at the same time? Hmm. Nah, it's not like it's a coincidence. Except that we're talking about the dean of the nerd school. I think she already knows. Which explains the thing at the end of the episode where she gives him the lab. The real question is, is the, nah, the dean wouldn't be working with the bad guy. No, because then why would they have to go and steal the object? And did the dean know about the qualities of the paperweight? Possibly, because you notice that she moves it back when it's returned to her desk. She changes how it's oriented. And speaking of some writing elements, they were trying to be kind of meta with how much he knew about comics and movies and stuff like that. But a lot of the jokes they were trying to do with it kind of fell flat because he's supposed to, he's trying to be energetic and a little off the wall. They're not quite writing him as well as they did in the movie. He's more of a, especially for the first half of the episode, an annoyance than he is anything productively comical. And in case you can't tell by the description, Lux is talking about Fred. Because in the movie, he was this source of crazy, wild energy, kind of like how Pinkie Pie is. But this was like a badly written Pinkie Pie episode. In terms of how Fred was handled, because... Okay, yes, he has all this comic book knowledge, and yes, it comes in handy if things fall into line with how they would actually happen in a comic book. You know, the joke about which way the car lands, that was pretty good. Mm -hmm, but that was about it. Yeah, I was just about to point out that one. It's mainly like the latter half is when everything starts to really fall into place, how jokes start to land better, and things start to work better. We weren't cringing through that half, but the first half with the whole thing, how they end up having to steal the thing. Also ended up getting Betamax's skeleton being copied and stuff like that. So it's like, the first half really falls 
flat a lot. It really kind of felt forced in a lot of places. I mean, it's like, okay, first, Yama is just a high-level bot fighter. Would he really have had all these ties? Uh, I'm not entirely buying this as a retcon. Like he's a gangster or something, because that's the kind of vibe I was getting, that he was a gangster that was underneath this higher person who's manipulating things. Which is how it comes across in the pilot, but he just comes across as an underground cage fighter, with the cage fighting being bot fighting in the movie. I mean, it was nice to see them trying to make all the connections back, because they brought Yama back. You know, they had to bring back everyone at Big Hero 6. Then we have Aunt Cass. We have Tadashi have a cameo with Hiro looking at the footage from an old video. And I like how they tied it into the very end of the movie. How basically the beginning of the end segment where Hiro punches and does a Betamax thing. And that falls out. And how they're all suited up and everything. It basically, it takes place between those two scenes at the very end of the movie. Basically, they cram this entire pilot as an in between quill of the movie. And Disney's pretty famous for in between quills, so I automatically kind of have a negative reaction to those. Belle's Magical World, the Tarzan movie with. I still can't believe they got George Carlin, but with George Carlin. Okay. That one I don't remember. I just remember the vagueness of the TV series. Though I must say a good in quote, or at least a decent movie is the Lion King one. That one was better. Lion King one and a half in the US, Lion King three in the rest of the world. But so many of them were not good or actually broke previous entries in the series because there were two sequels to Cinderella and one of them, well, they were actually both kind of in quotes. And the two of them canceled each other out. They contradicted each other. You've mentioned this before. I don't know if you've actually mentioned it on one of our recordings, but you've definitely mentioned it before to me. I like that they were tying it back to the movie and how they did the ending of the pilot episode. But I would have been okay if that was the beginning of the pilot episode. You know, make the pilot episode pick up at the end of the movie, front load with that, and then flashback to the in-between. That, to me, would have felt smoother. Because you pick up exactly where you left off at the end of the movie, and then go back and fill in the blanks. Hmm. And please, I wish you'd done a better job filling in the blanks. I mean, I can't believe Fred agreed to help steal the paperweight. He seems, he's supposed to be kind of an, an airy kind of character, or kind of go-with-the-flow kind of character. And I think that's where they get away with having him do that. But they didn't quite handle him well enough for us to believe that. The first half just doesn't work. The last half is good once you get past all of that. It's a decent setup. The resistance makes sense. It's like we agreed to do this like once, maybe twice. We don't want to do this anymore. That wasn't handled as well as it could have. But it was, it made sense for the characters. But the way they did it. The voice actors are pretty good. A lot of them sound a lot like the characters from the movie. I think Baymax is actually voiced by the same person. Very possible. But overall, they got good matches in terms of voice actors for the whole cast. And, you know, the reluctance makes sense. It didn't feel very well done, but it makes sense because they were reluctant even in the movie. Because they said, we're not heroes, we're nerds. We're just us. And they go into the, no, but you can be so much more. And the conflict that the professor sets up of like be like Tadashi don't do this other stuff I'm like well here's the thing especially at the end they uh Hiro gets what it actually means to be like Tadashi yeah it's not to follow exactly in Tadashi's footsteps it's to believe in the methodology and the morals that Tadashi had he wanted to make something that would change the world for the better and to help a lot of people it doesn't always mean what Baymax was originally designed for. It may mean using Baymax outside of his default configuration. By putting armor on him and flying around and saving people that way. Also, in emergency situations, he can administer medical help. It's always very helpful to have a cleric on your team that has good armor. Dang it. The cleric's dead again. How will we heal? Does anyone else know resurrection? Hmm. Hmm. Anyone have any Phoenix Downs? 
Ooh. Did anyone buy those in the last town? N no one? So, anything else you want to go over about this? The supposed car theft chase? <laughs> the moment that happened, I was like, it is not going to be anything what they were expecting. I was like, no. something's going on in there. I did think maybe a pregnant woman at one point. Also, at that point, instead of having him drive off, offer to take them there. To give them an escort, not just go, sorry. Well, after you essentially attack them, you think they're going to accept that kind of help? You're not established heroes. You guys showed up like once. I immediately saw that scene. I was like, this is a setup. I do like how in the background, <laughs> Baymax's body and Hero are just, come on, like, come on, guys. There's got to be something. There's nothing going on. Running across the background. That, that is nice. But even the whole thing, not just the body going out of control, but Baymax saying that Tadashi always ran this diagnostic scan. If we go back to the movie and watch Baymax's recordings of Tadashi's 50 million tests on Baymax, the body malfunctioned multiple times in a bad way. Which means he probably did run those, but it didn't always completely clear the body of any problems. Well, it wasn't supposed to clear the body, it was a diagnostic, so if he was running these diagnostics, the diagnostics weren't picking up all the problems. Also, I get Aunt Cass and the butterfish. I get the fish being a dinner dish. I do not get the fish nachos at the restaurant. I remember it primarily being more of a bakery because she's so mad that she had to leave to pick the two idiots up from the police station on, like, beatnik poetry night. Yeah, it felt more like a coffee shop. And this came across more like a diner. Also, it's still strange hearing San Francisco or something, however they pronounce it. I wonder if that was in the original comics, because that's the only way it can kind of be forgivable, how old were the original comics, and I'm sure it was mind-blowing at the time. I don't know. I did some research into the original comics, and not recently, so my brain's a little fuzzy on this, but they looked pretty modern when I was finding the first issues. So I don't know. There's been more to look into. But naming isn't always a strong suit. What was that element in Avatar Unobtainium? <laughs> you're, you're naming this this. Are you crazy? We just got some. How do you know that it's unobtainable? We just got some. It's kind of like the forest, no return. There's treasure in there. How do we know? Because <laughs> we've looked everywhere else. Eh, good point. Maybe you wanted the armor of invincibility. <sighs> nah. 8-bit theater reference, check. Anything else you'd like to go over? Or should we start wrapping things up? Um, uh, let's see. Aunt Cass, the Dean, the car chase. Actually, we, we summarized a lot of it of going it was painful and wonky in the beginning. It just hit me. I wonder if the bad guy in this series actually is the bad guy. Well, not the bad guy. Um, The person that we were told was the bad guy in the movie. Oh, that would be funny if it was Cray. Yeah, it just seems like, wait a minute, that voice sounded familiar. He has the money and the intelligence to do this. If not the intelligence, the staff. Because he can hire smart people. It would be interesting if it was Cray. Uh... Only if it's handled well, because otherwise it would be more of just trying to shoehorn tiebacks to the movie. Mm. So, going back to sound, I don't remember any music from this. I know there was definitely music playing and background stuff, but nothing really memorable. None of it really clicked. Like, I can clearly remember parts from the soundtrack of the movie, not just my favorite song. <laughs> Immortals, that's a great song. It's a really great song. It makes great AMVs and videos, and it's just an awesome song. I danced for hours to it after first seeing the movie. <laughs> and I bought the soundtrack immediately once it came out. So, even though I technically could have bought that only one song, but... Yeah, but the instrumentals are nice, too. It is very different for a Disney soundtrack. You only have one verbal song, and the rest are all instrumentals. And I'm pretty sure they used some of the instrumentals from... The movie, but they just not stuck in my head from this. And no, and they did it so lightly, or it was so overwhelmed by all of those cringeworthy moments. Or just the action itself. Because there was definitely action. 
And that was where the animation was smoothest, was in heavy action sequences. Maybe they ran over budget and they had to pick which ones they were going to focus on. But unlike uh, Blossom Detective Holmes, we could very clearly feel where, oh, they could have done some more work on this. And we're talking about a Disney production with a staff of probably a couple of hundred people. Which means it really shouldn't look like that. But then we can go back and point out the 101 Dalmatians television series. And it may not just be the staff, it may just be the time limit. We don't know how long they actually had to put this together. No, they may have had to rush it. We know that Disney and scheduling don't always work together. DuckTales, cough, DuckTales. Mm-hmm. Maybe hints for future recordings, but moving on! <laughs> Nothing else really sticks in, out in my mind right now that I want to go over. It's just that animation. Overall, it's an okay start. It's got a lot of weaknesses. They can be ironed out. Because I've heard that the new X-Files reboot or continuation, the first episode is terrible. But the second episode apparently is really good. So it may just be the staff writers for the pilot and whoever writes the next episode because they usually rotate out people. Because then they can get scripts done more quickly because you have multiple writers working on multiple scripts and then you end up with six or seven scripts where if you only had a single author or a single team working together all the time, you have fewer scripts total. Though in that case, the scripts tend to have more continuity, though some of that is broadcast order. It's a good start. I'm interested in seeing more episodes just to see if they go up a notch, or if they maintain, or if they go down. The thing is, I was really excited after we watched the movie. You go back to that recording, that recording was off the hook, and my mic died, and I had to do like 30 pickup lines for that, and I still managed to maintain the enthusiasm in the pickup line. So this had a lot to live up to, because despite its flaws, I really enjoyed the original theatrical movie. And I'm just glad I've been hearing rumors that they are actually working on a sequel to it and have been on a for a while. And I, that may be why they wanted to do this series, too, to help lead up to and promote the sequel when it comes out, which I have a feeling will, do, will have nothing to do with the TV series. Probably not. There will likely be a complete break between the two. I'm thinking they'll handle it like the first Power Rangers movie, where basically had n nothing in common with the series except the cast. And then when they got to that point in the series, they came up with different excuses to have the new Zords and everything. I was also thinking more along the lines of How to Train Your Dragon. DreamWorks did a TV series version of that, which was good on its own. But they also released the second movie, which completely contradicts everything that happens in the TV series. They have nothing in common. They're, they're separate. They're side canon. So the TV series is like an alternate universe, and the movies all line up. And this has been our thoughts on Big Hero 6, the television series, pilot episode. Uh, you guys do realize we don't actually have, like, after credit features, right? We don't even have credits. Our name's kind of in the intro and in the description and on the channel, but hey, you stuck around, so sales pitch. If you like Lux's art, you can find more of it all over the internet. There's links. There are places like DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, etc. Also, if you don't want to leave YouTube, we have lots of other videos. You can like, subscribe, share, comment. Thank you to our current prolific commenters. Sasami-chan and Fan of the Gourmet, you two were awesome! But, ah, uh, yes, you are finally ready to leave YouTube. So if you don't want to go check out all the various art links, you can click on the other links. Well, the Patreon link still kind of has art on it, but it's kind of behind a paywall. It's only a dollar for sketches, and, and you get to vote on sketches. But, you know, that's a thing. You can provide input, and there's higher tiers if you feel like it. And thank you to Lux's current patrons. Awesome. We love you in that totally we're friends and we're glad that you like our work sort of way. Oh yeah, you don't want a monthly thing. I get that. Monthly can be kind of hard to schedule. I just want to do a one-time deal or you just don't like Patreon. That's okay if you don't. It's not for everybody. Uh, we also have a setup on coffee, KO-FI, which works in $3 increments. No long-term commitments. We understand. You might not be ready to commit, you know. 
Relationships are such a daunting thing. And complicated. <laughs> Thanks again for listening.